So I started this sermon series two weeks, ago, two weeks ago called Some Theology, and I have not had, I've had so many comments from people about this sermon series, more comments than I've, I've ever had with any other thing that I've preached on. Uh, leading up to uh, the sermon series, I had a number of people tell me how, how excited they were. Since I've started it, people have told me how, how much they're enjoying it, and I think it's because music resonates with people. We just, we just, we resonate with music. God created music. He created music uh, to be a communication device. It, it connects with our hearts. It bypasses our mind and just goes straight to our hearts. And so I think people are really resonate with this. And, and so this is the third week of it, and uh, we're following a timeline uh, that I've been talking about, a timeline called a seven, what I call the seven eras of doxology. So two weeks ago, we started with uh, the Old Testament music and singing. Last week was the New Testament and early church. Today we're going to look at the medieval period. Uh, an era that is so foreign to us, as you'll see. Uh, next week will be the Reformation, and then, then English hymnology, then we'll, the Revivalists, and then we'll conclude uh, with the Jesus movement of the 1970s, which a lot of you, including myself, was, we were, were around during that time and remember uh, some of those people and the, the music of the Jesus movement. So I said this last week, with, with each of these eras, there was a certain emphasis that that particular era uh, focused on. And so like last week, the emphasis was creed. And we talked about the, the creeds of the church that developed in the early church as a way, as a tool to combat heresy. And so uh, that was really the development of orthodoxy and what it was as a church universal that we believed. And so today, we're going to be in the medieval period, the ritual, liturgy, and the Gregorian chants. And they had a, a specific... Uh, emphasis as well, which I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit here soon. Uh, but our, our passage for today is a short one. Usually I, I, I have longer passages. This one's only three verses long. Uh, so we have a short passage today. It's in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And this is the Apostle Paul. And this is what he says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So that's our passage for today. And what I'm really going to focus on is this idea of making our bodies a living sacrifice. And uh, like I said, uh, the, the, each of these seven eras have an emphasis that they focus on. And that er the emphasis of the medieval period is this word called asceticism. I have a hard time saying that. Asceticism. And what that is, that's the harsh treatment of the body for spiritual gain. Uh, the harsh treatment. So uh, uh, when you think of uh, maybe if somebody, somebody went, uh, uh, you know, took a, a vow of, of, of poverty, you know, or a vow of silence, or, uh, you know, or they starve themselves, you know, for the sake of Christ, that's, that's asceticism. That's, that's going to extremes, you know, inflicting bodily harm upon yourself for the sake of a spiritual gain. So that's what asceticism is. And uh, we see, uh, see this develop in the Middle Ages uh, where, where people were taking Paul's words of being a living sacrifice and being humble, and they, and they took it way beyond what he ever intended. And so I'm going to give you some examples, okay? Because this is just not exclusive to Christianity. In all religions, there's people who practice asceticism. Uh, but uh, even today, we have people who practice it to an extreme. And I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to show you some pictures here. And uh, a couple of them are a little gory, so I hope I don't make you, you know, woozy here. But here's the first one. This is called self-flagellation. And this is where people try to identify with the whippings of Christ by whipping themselves. Okay? And you see this a lot in third world countries. Some more of the Catholic uh, third world countries like the Philippines, this is, this is practiced. And during the Holy Week and the Easter, you know, men will be walking down the streets and they'll be, be whipping themselves into a bloody mess. Uh, a bloody ma uh, mass, th thinking somehow that that makes them spiritual, okay? Uh, another extreme example um, is uh, 
self-crucifixion. Um, in, in the Philippines, uh, you see this a lot where people will actually crucify themselves trying to identify with the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, you know, in the Middle Ages was the development of the monastery and the monastic life you know, uh, of monks who wanted to get away from the world altogether, so they locked themselves away in these monasteries high up on a hill you know, where no one could get to, and they secluded themselves, and they took vows of silence and vows of poverty and that type of thing. I'm going to give you one more example. and this, this one takes the cake. This is a guy named Simeon the Stylite. Uh, Simeon the Stylite, he lived in the 4th century, and uh, he joined a monastery when he was 16 years old. And he had such radical views on asceticism and what should be done that even the monks didn't like it, and they kicked him out of the monastery. He's too radical. And so he went and lived in a cave for a year and a half, uh, you know, and put, people would find him, you know, and they'd want to come talk to him. And so after a year and a half of being in a cave, he, he, he wanted to get away from people. And so he built a nine-foot uh, pillar, and he climbed up on top of it, and he stayed up there for a year. Well, nine foot's not that high. You can, people were still walking up and talking to him, you know. And, and so he did a, did a much better job, and he, so he built a 50-foot pillar, climbed up on top of the 50-foot pillar, stayed there for the rest of his life. 37 years. Stayed up on the pillar for 37 years. And, you know, he had a, some kind of basket where, you know, he'd lower down, they put food in him. And don't ask, don't ask me what he did to go to the bathroom. I have no idea. You know, I, you know, just let your imagination figure that one out. Okay, but 37 years he stayed up on that pillar. Okay, is that what God means? All those examples, is that what Paul means when he says to make your body a living sacrifice? That we are to, to whip ourselves into a, a bloody pulp? Uh, you know, that we are to climb up on top of a pillar and, and, and get away from the world? Is that what it means? I don't think so. I don't think that's what, what Paul means. And so we're going to read that passage again, and we're going to talk about what it means to be a living sacrifice. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And so taking that passage, we're going to talk about what it means to be a living sacrifice when it comes to worship. And so here's the th first thing. Worship is life-giving. Worship should be life-giving. Worship should be a, a fertile ground of flourishing spiritually, not beating yourself into a bloody pulp, okay? Paul says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I, I want to focus on the word living because in the Old Testament, sacrifices was based upon death, wasn't it? The death of an animal. When uh, uh, God uh, asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it was, it was, a, it was going to be a sacrifice of death until God intervened. Uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross was a, a cross of death. But Paul says here to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so God is the author of life, living sacrifice. When we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, we're offering ourselves in a way that brings and breathes forth life into us. A living sacrifice. And so to talk about what it means to be a living sacrifice, let's talk about what it's not first. Okay, a living sacrifice, what it's not. It's not asceticism at all. It's as though Paul kind of regretted his words in Romans 12 because people were taking them a little too far. We come to Colossians 2 and it's like he says, oh, let's get some clarification to what I meant here. Okay? He says this, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and here it is, their harsh treatment of the body, 
but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgences. What Paul is saying is that all these rules and regulations and the harsh treatment of the body and the false humility and the self-imposed worship, the things that people think they have to do in order to please God, has zero, zero value. None. Everybody say zero. Zero, zero, zero. Has no value whatsoever because you still retain the inner self, which is sinful. and You still have those sinful thoughts and desires. You can lock yourself away in a closet for the rest of your life, and that's not going to save you from the, your mind, the thoughts that you have in your mind. You're still going to have sinful thoughts. You're still, so none of that has any value. And so it's as though Paul is like correcting, or not correcting, but he's giving some clarity to what he talked about in Romans chapter 12 when we present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. And so being a living sacrifice is not asceticism. Okay, that's where they got it wrong. That's where people still get it wrong. Uh, depriving yourself of things, uh, uh, putting your body through hardship, that's, that's not what pleases God. There's no value in that. So what is being a living sacrifice? I think there's a, a number of things that I could have come up with. I could have probably come up with 10 of what it means to be a living sacrifice. But we're talking about music. We're talking about worship. And so I think one of the first things about being a living sacrifice is that being a living sacrifice is a life-giving spirituality. It's life-giving. When you walk in the Spirit of God, when you walk under the, the, the obedience of Christ and the Word of God, there's going to be a peace, as Don was talking about. There's going to be a peace there. There's going to be a joy there that you can't get from the world. And it's the inner peace. It's the inner joy, something that the world can't manufacture. And one of the things that, that brings forth all that is joyful singing, right? We just sing, joyful singing. Paul says this in Ephesians 5, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled by the, with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I love what Paul says there. In a way, he kind of makes a comparison to being drunk. He says, hey, if you're going to be joyful, if you're going to be giddy, if you're going to be jumping up and down, do it because you're singing to the Lord, not because you're drunk, okay? And so in a way, it's just like joyful singing, the spirit-filled life should be so joyous to us, and so should be so exciting to us that some people might mistake us for being drunk, okay? In Acts chapter 2, when the, the Holy Spirit you know, poured out, you know, some people said, What's, why are these people drunk? It's only 9 in the morning, Okay? We should be so filled with joy. And, and, and worship, a corporate worship service, shouldn't be boring, right? It shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't put you to sleep. It shouldn't be so rigid and so, yeah, so rigid that, that there's no room to, to breathe spiritually. It should be full of joy. In the, in the Middle Ages, they, they got away from this. You're familiar with the, tel the telephone game, right? You know, you have an original message with an original person, and the further you get away from that original person, that the more the message starts to get disoriented and, and mixed up and messed up, and before you know it, it's something completely different. Well, in the first couple, couple centuries, two, three hundred years, uh, first couple years, a uh, hundred years after, after the, you know, the Christ and the early church, the message pretty much was the same. But by the time you get to the fourth century, the fifth century, the sixth century, you see uh, the, the practice of worship turn into something completely foreign to the apostles and to the early church. And this began with um, the Council of Laodicea in 367 A.D. The Council of Laodicea, believe it or not, the outlawed congregational singing. It says, Besides the appointed singers who mount the ambo and sing from the book, others shall not sing in church. And the ambo is the the pulpit, that's what that anambo is. So anyway, in other words, only those who could sing in church was the priest or the, uh, the professional clergy or, or a trained choir. And they forbid the congregation from singing. Isn't that crazy? I don't, I've heard several explana explanations as to why. I, I don't really know why, why they did that. But that was what they decided. And so worship became more of... Uh, 
a high church, what I call high church, liturgical, uh, very rigid uh, experience where the people were just observers. They didn't participate in the worship service. It was all done by up on stage on the priest, by the priest. And I was reading about this, and the priest would actually come up on stage, and there would be a screen right here, you know, that people could kind of see through, and he'd have his back turned to the congregation doing his, his duty up on stage uh, with, the, with, the, with the mass, you know, and then the elements and stuff. And so, and so worship just became just this observation. And they got away from the biblical mandate to sing together, as it says in Psalm 107, 32, let, him, let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. So worship is a corporate experience that should be joyful. It shouldn't be dry. It shouldn't be boring. It shouldn't be something that you observe from a distance. And if I could make a little bit of a criticism for today's modern worship, some of the bigger churches, that's really what you have. You have people who observe, and you have a professional musicians up on stage doing the worship. Eric was just telling me this this morning. Uh, a couple weeks ago, they went to a bigger church in the area to see some, some friends, uh, their kids get baptized. And Eric told me, he's like, man, you know, the music was good, the musicians was good, but it was more of just a concert, wasn't it? He said it was just kind of sat back and he just kind of observed and listened. It didn't really feel invited to, to come in and participate in the worship. And so they got away from, from that. And, uh, and as the, the church developed, uh, they, they became more and more uh, particular about the type of music, the type of music that they sang. It was very uh, complicated. You couldn't sing it anyways, you know, if you wanted to. And in the 6th century, uh, Pope Gregory, he, he, he made some guidelines about singing. And he said you can only sing in unison. And it has to be, uh, basically, it has to be fit this certain complicated style and became known as Gregorian chants. Okay, in the 6th sixth, sixth century, it was, that was worship, Gregorian chants. I'm sure you've probably all heard of I've heard at some point the Gregorian chants, and there's beauty to that. I'm not saying that there's, there's not. There's beauty to that, that Gregorian chant, uh, but it's in Latin, so no one could understand it. You know, they did their masses in Latin, and that wasn't the vernacular of the local people, so they couldn't understand it. No one, no one participated. You know, they just sat there and listened or watched. I, I want to show you a video here in a second. I, I, I have a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, who told me about... Um, this uh, place in Kentucky, it's a, it's a monastery called the Abbey of Gethsemane. And uh, the, the monks there are called Trappist monks. And they take a, a vow of silence. They can't, they can't talk. Uh, but they have a retreat center. And you can go and actually have a, a spiritual retreat there. And they don't charge anything. They, they ask, all they ask for is a donation. And so my pastor friend, he goes down there probably twice a, twice a year. And so I, one year I thought, I'll go down there. I, I'd be kind of fun, you know. And so uh, I went down there, uh, down in Kentucky, south of Louisville, uh, to this, this monastery. And they're known for, their, uh, for their, their fudge and their fruitcakes. That's how they support themselves. They, they sell fudge and fruitcakes, you know, online and stuff. But anyways, uh, they meet seven, seven times a day, day for prayer and worship. And so, um, and so there's a, in the chapel, there's a, a balcony where visitors can stand up there. And so I took a video of, of them uh, with my iPad I just, want, I just want to show you. Let's go ahead and show that. 
beautiful, something beautiful about that. Uh, meeting seven times a, a day to sing and worship God. And by the way, the first time they, they get together is at 3.30 in the morning. And the last time they get together is at midnight. And so they do this every day, seven days a week. Seven days a week, they get together seven times throughout the day, and they sing. I don't know how they get their sleep. I don't know. Um, and so I went to several of those, uh, those, those uh, uh, where they sang and, and worshiped. And, and, but then again, like I said, I was, I was just a, a participant. I was just an observer. Okay, and uh, worship should be corporate. It should be joyful. And so, to be a living sacrifice is to is to worship with a body of believers, proclaiming Jesus, who He is, who God is. Worshiping on your own, you know. How many here you're crank, going down the road and you got the, you know your Christian music cranked up? You know, listening, listening. Mary's got her hand up. You know, worshiping, worshiping God through music, joyful singing. Uh, another way that we are a, sac- a fr- uh, sacrifice to God is living a Christ, what I call a Christ-sufficient life. A Christ-sufficient life. Paul says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. What Paul is saying is that I no longer live for myself, but I live for Christ who lives within me, and it's him who motivates me to live for him. And I don't rely on my own self-efforts. He says if, if, if righteousness could be gained through my own self-efforts, what he calls the law, if, I, if righteousness could be gained by whipping myself or crucifying myself or climbing up on a pole or locking myself away in a monastery and taking a vow of silence, if, if righteousness could be gained that way, then Christ died for nothing. Okay, our salvation is based upon what Christ has done for us, not what we do for Christ. Let me say that again. Our salvation is based upon what Christ has done for us, not what we do for, for him. Now, of course, we do want to live in a way that honors him, saying no to the flesh, you know, saying no to the things of the world, living a life that pleases Christ. But that's not what saves us. It's, it's what motivates us to live for him. So worship is life-giving. It should, it should be flourishing. You should flourish spiritually if you are making yourself a living sacrifice for him. Here's, here's a second part of worship and and that we see in that passage out of Romans 12 is that worship is transformative. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so worship, part of worship, whether it's corporate, whether it's private, whether it's singing, whether it's being in the word, whether it's practicing the spiritual disciplines, it should transform you so that you are not who you used to be. And I said this a lot. At some point in your life, you should have a before and after picture, who who you were before Christ and who you are now. But that transformative process doesn't come by whipping yourself or by locking yourself away in the monastery. It's actually a, a ministry of the Holy Spirit to transform us. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work, not self discipline, not willpower. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, now the the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. That's awesome. There's freedom. There should be freedom in Christ. Where the Spirit of God is, there's freedom. There there shouldn't be rigidness. And Paul says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so it's God who does the transforming. He's the one who works in our hearts to bring us to a place of repentance, to bring us to the place where we're convicted of sin and so that we no longer want to walk in that sin, transforms us into more and more like Christ. Has anybody ever seen the Northern Lights? You ever seen them in person? Anybody? Nobody. Oh, you have. Okay. I, I have yet to. I would love to see the Northern Lights. You have to go up north. You have to go up to Canada or Alaska. 
And uh, that's just a still image, but apparently they kind of bounce around, you know, and they kind of, it's like a light show. And of course, for, for centuries, no one knew what, what it was until science finally figured out what it was. And a few years ago, I, I, I uh, was reading about what causes the northern lights, and I immediately made a, a spiritual connection. Because what you're seeing, you know, hundreds of miles above you is actually a result of what's happening hundreds of, mi- hundreds of miles below you. It's a result of the Earth's uh, magnetic field. Because uh, those, those lights are, are solar flares that are coming at the Earth a million miles per hour. And they hit our, our magnetic field and bounce off. It's, it's God's design to protect our, the Earth from the sun. And they bounce off, and it's that bouncing off that creates all those lights. And, and it's our magnetic field that is in the very core of the Earth that's, that's producing this, this barrier so that there's beauty on the outside, but it's actually a result of what's happening on the inside. And when I read that, I thought, that's just like the Holy Spirit, you know? The Holy Spirit gets in our heart and he transforms us and makes us into his image, and, and the beauty of that is what people see on the outside, what's reflecting on the inside. And so it's the Holy Spirit that transforms us, and as we worship, as we worship, the Holy Spirit, we invite him in to do his work. Worship awakens a desire to, to change by challenging our, our spiritual status quo. Certain hymns and praise choruses, when taken seriously, are guaranteed to challenge our hearts. Who can sing the classic hymns, I Surrender All and Have Thine Own Way and All for Jesus without fully considering the implications of what we're singing about? I was reading this article by a, a guy named Rory Noland. And he says this, he says, Very often the Holy Spirit uses worship to convict us of sin. One time I was embroiled in a sticky relational conflict with a brother in Christ. However, I was absolutely convinced that I was right and he was wrong. Then I came to church. During the first song, we were invited to humble ourselves uh, before the Lord. The second song proclaimed that God graciously forgives sinners such as I. Needless to say, I was immediately convinced, convicted of my pride and arrogance and realized that my stubbornness was preventing reconciliation. The next morning, I apologized and made amends. Okay? So through the worship experience of, of singing these songs that are meant to penetrate our hearts, the Holy Spirit went to work in that guy's heart. How many times have you been singing a song and all of a sudden, it grips you? You know, it grips you. Because you're you're paying attention to what you're singing and the Holy Spirit is using that as a tool to gradually change you. It's the Lord who does the work. As it says in Philippians 2, 13, 4, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fill his purpose. The spiritual life is not necessarily an aspect of of um, self-will, even though that might be a part of it. Ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that works in your heart to transform you. And so worship should be transformative, whether it's corporate worship or private. So worship is life-giving. It should be life-giving. It's, it's transformative. And here's the third one. Worship is contemplative. Paul says in verse 3, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So contemplative worship, if you worship in a way that's contemplative, it's always going to lead you to a place of humility and humbleness. Because, number one, you contemplate on the mystery of Christ, on his work. This is where more, some of more of the liturgical church traditions focus their worship on uh, contemplation. Exercises of contemplation. It's why we have the cross on the wall. We look at the cross and it forces us to contemplate, you know, uh, what Christ did. Some church traditions use icons like the Orthodox Church. You walk in, their, their walls are covered with pictures that are meant, you know, of the saints and of Jesus and of Mary. And th- those are meant to force you to contemplate uh, what it is, why you're there, why you worship. And so worship should be contemplative. And when it's contemplative, it brings you to a place of humility. And it starts with focusing on Christ. 
Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews says, fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So fix your eyes on Jesus. Consider him. That's a part of our worship. That's why we look at the cross. Some people get tattoos, you know, of a cross. Yeah, uh, this is a side note. Yesterday I was in the, at a gas station. And I got to talking to a guy in line. He was bald, just like your husband, just completely bald. In the back of his head, the whole head, I, I swear to you, the whole head was the Golden Dome of Notre Dame. <laughs> he had tattooed. Tattooed the whole thing on his back of his head. Clearly he's a fan, even though they played terrible yesterday, right? Imagery. You know, imagery serves to contemplate Christ, fixing our eyes on Jesus, considering him. And when we consider and we fix our eyes on Jesus and we realize what it is he did for us, it brings us to a place of humility and humbleness that Christ would do such a thing for us. But it's not only just focusing on Christ, but it's also focusing on your need for Christ. When you focus on your need for Christ, it brings you to a place of humility and humbleness. As Romans 3 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All, it means all. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's such a great passage. But when you take it seriously, when you, when you, when you say it, it says that all have sinned, it leaves no room for pride and arrogance. And we must focus on our need for him. And when we do, when we focus on him, when we focus on our need, it brings us to a place of humility. I love this quote from Dr. Howard L. Rice. He says, God requires honesty from us and such honesty can be painful because God knows us better than we know ourselves. Pretending will not work. God's knowledge of us demands that we come to terms with who we really are. Isn't that true? We have to come to terms with who we really are. And that requires humility. It requires humbleness. And part of our worship experience is contemplating on who Christ is and what he did for us. So worship is life-giving. Worship is transformative, changes you. Worship is contemplative. And in the, midst, the, the uh, medieval period, they got away from that. And it became more about form and function and liturgy than it was about a personal relationship and experience with Christ. And so next week, we're going to uh, talk about the Reformation and how the desire of the leaders of the Reformation was to bring congregational worship back, back to the church, which they did, and to make worship a more participatory than, than an, ob an observation. So my challenge to you is this. When you worship God, uh, do you feel alive? Do you feel alive when you worship? Can you look into your life and see how God has molded you and the spiritual formation of of changing your heart so that you are no longer the person that you used to be, but you are a person who desires to live for him? Do you, do you spend time contemplating Christ and what he did for you? Do you spend time contemplating your need for Christ and the cross? If you do, that's just the beginning of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Like I said, I could probably come up with 10 more, 10 more items. Being a living sacrifice. In other words, committing your life, dedicating it for the sole purpose of living for Christ and Him alone. Amen? Amen. So God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, that I pray, God, that all of us, our desire would be just that. God, that we would desire to be a living sacrifice. God, that you would make our bodies your temple, as your word says that your spirit would dwell within us. God, that when people see us, they see the result of what has happened on the inside, the transformation, and the beauty that results from that and how we treat people and how we talk to people and the way that we behave, God, that it would reflect you and reflect Christ. Lord, prepare us to be that living sacrifice. May it be a daily commitment and a daily challenge to honor you in that way. And I pray this in your name, amen.